So welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining. Um, my name is Shunta Takino and I'm a policy analyst at the OECD working on youth and mental health policies. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be moderating this session today on attitudes, aspirations and crisis res resilience as part of the uh, Berlin Demography Days event. So today we'll be, and in this session, we'll be discussing how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected young people's attitudes and aspirations and how we can support young people facing very uncertain and difficult times. So we'll begin with a keynote speech from uh, Professor Ingrid Schoon. Uh, Ingrid is the Professor of Human Development and Social Policy at University College London, and also the Chair of Social Policy at the Social uh, Research Institute. So without further ado, let me hand over to you, Ingrid, to kick us off. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to this important event and allowing me to share my thoughts about potential crisis resilience of young people. First of all, I would like to clarify that the notion of young people or youth is a rather broad construct, generally referring to young people aged 16 to 25 or 24, yet often used in a more flexible way, stretching from early childhood to the adult years, that is young adults in their 30s. There are, however, very different developmental demands for young children, adolescents and young adults, forcing us to be specific about what age group or developmental phase we are referring to. Also, development during early childhood influences later outcomes. Each life phase has its unique challenges, which can imply the occurrence of turning points and the change in preset pathways. In my presentation, I focus on career readiness, arguing that the transition to employment is a crucial developmental task for young people and that problems encountered during that transition can have long term consequences, not only regarding later employment, but also regarding family formation, social integration, health and well-being. The transition to employment can take place after the completion of compulsory schooling, which in some countries occurs as early as age 15 or 16, which has then distinct challenges in particular for those who live with only limited or low levels of qualification, in contrast to those who continue in further or higher education and make this transition later in life. There are, however, common risks that have to be negotiated by all young people. As we have already heard, the COVID pandemic has affected nearly every aspect of young people's lives, including a disruption of their education, school closures and learning loss, a destruction of their employment and training opportunities and career prospects, and it has undermined the health and well-being and challenged their outlook for the future. Yet even before the onset of the pandemic, the social economic integration of young people has been an ongoing challenge. Since the turn of the millennium, there has been rising precarious and temporary employment among young people, rising levels of young people not being in education, employment or training, the need group, rising career uncertainties and worrying increase in mental health problems. With the exception of the COVID-related health stress and uh, lockdown measures, we are thus facing challenges that originated already before the pandemic. The pandemic itself has led to a stress proliferation, i.e. new pandemic-related strains have un, uh, intensified already existing stressors, leading to an acceleration of pre-existing inequalities, which in the long term will lead to an increasing polarization of life chances, as we ha heard yesterday in uh, Professor Hullemann's lectures but also depletion of already challenged resources, in particular among those who are already vulnerable and those who are only just able to get by. Pre-pandemic and pandemic-related stressors are generally interlinked, creating cumulative risks and spillover effects. For example, in a study of the British Longitudinal Household Panel Study, we could show that there are significant associations between economic activity and mental health of young people. Both youth unemployment and mental health problems increased during the pandemic, and there has been an increase in the association, in particular for those who are in part-time employment or economically inactive. Moreover, there is evidence to suggest that the fear of losing an academic year's worth of learning uh, has a significant impact on students' psychological distress. 
Pandemic related stresses have of course also impacted on the aspirations and expectations of young people. Here my argument is that for a comprehensive understanding of the role of future orientations in steering behavior in times of crisis, we have to examine their multiple facets and influences. Asking what motivates individuals, it is helpful to consider the classical expectancy value series, which argue that goal choices and their pursuit are determined by expectancies about the likelihood of attaining, of attaining the goal and values associated with that goal. Parents and children from relatively disadvantaged backgrounds are generally facing greater social, economic and cultural challenges when developing their career goals. And it has been argued that their horizon of perceived possibilities tends to be foreshortened. Relative disadvantaged young people and their parents tend to express lower aspirations and expectations than their more privileged peers, and they are less likely to apply to university and ultimately to enroll and complete tertiary education, even those with similar or even higher levels of cognitive ability. In defining or in defining these career aspirations, we have to differentiate between aspirations, which are reflecting the more idealistic hopes and expectations referring to more realistic evaluation of what is possible to achieve given existing constraints. So in calculating or in developing their life goals, young people already take into account the uh, constraints they are facing. Both aspirations and uh, expectations comprise the, the capability to not only set the goals, but also to plan their pursuit. And they can such, uh, such act as a motor or a compass guiding behaviors and the pursuit of one's goals as reflected in the significant associations between career aspirations, in particular the more realistic expectations and later occupation attainment and out, uh, income. Both idealistic and more realistic expectations are shaped by socioeconomic constraints, individual competences and self-perceptions, institutional structures and the wider socio-historical context, including non-normative events such as the current pandemic. Yet not all young people are certain about their careers. There is an increase, for example, in uncertainty, in particular among those from relatively disadvantaged families. For example, the PISA study had asked 14-year-olds uh, what occupation they expect to be working in when they're 30 years old. While in PISA 2000, 14% of the students did not know what the job they will have by age 13, this increased to 25% of students in 2018. Evidence from the UK Millennium Cohort suggests that in 2018, about a third of 18-year-olds were uncertain about their future careers. And the UK COVID Youth Economic Activity and Health Monitor of the Year study suggests that 42% of young people were uncertain about their future jobs. Yet it is generally assumed that high aspirations can boost attainment and the number of government in initiatives aiming to support young people's attainment and social mobilities are focusing on raising the aspirations of young people, yet they fail to take into account issues of these uncertainties or potential mismatches between education and occupational uh, expectations or non-aligned ambitions between young people and their parents. Evidence suggests that while young people have become increasingly ambitious, i.e. either aim for, uh, for higher education and professional jobs, they do not necessarily know how to realize these ambitions. They are ambitious but directionless. For example, in the UK year study, we found that one one in three of those young people who expected to get into a professional job did not expect to complete a degree level qualification, indicating a lack of knowledge about what qualifications are needed to get a desired job. Misaligned uh, education and occupational ambitions are more prevalent amongst relatively disadvantaged young people and in turn they are associated with later occupational outcomes. Moreover, one has to consider that parents play a crucial role in supporting the career development of their children. And young people and their parents are not always in agreement about uh, 
their career ambitions. For example, evidence from the UK birth cohort studies show that in more recent cohorts, the educational aspirations of young people tend to be higher than those that their parents have for them. This might be due to increased study fees and the prospect of rising student debts and increased concerns about uh, amongst the parents. Discrepancy uh, about these young people and uh, own career aspiration, those of their parents, they might indicate conflicts or lack of trust between parents and children. And uh, so um, it has to be considered when studying the aspirations and expectations for the future. But what can be done to support young people in developing career readiness in times of crisis? Here, my argument is that career readiness can be improved through appropriate career-related activities and guidance, ideally delivered within a holistic, person-centered, and developmentally appropriate approach. Also, career guidance can sound career curiously outmoded in a context in which old-style continuous careers are vanishing. There has been little advance in finding a better term for high-quality guidance services that help individuals with critical skills, information, and confidence to navigate a changing work life, particularly during turbulent times. Career guidance in this context describes services which help people to make of any age to make the education, training and occupation decisions that will affect who they might become in life and work. And these new modes of career guidance, they have already been recommended by the OECD, the EU and uh, the international labor organizations aim to provide people with personalized, impartial and timely information and support. They recognize the importance of lifelong learning, not limiting their scope to the first transition into the labor market, but enabling individuals to continue learning throughout their lives to upskill, reskill and empowering them to navigate a rapidly changing world of work. These measures should ideally begin early, i.e. from primary education and intensify at key decision points, such as transition to employment or change of career. And the related issue here is the introduction of individual learner account as also as a pro uh, proposed by the EU, which provides individual training entitlements that can be used throughout one's career over one's life. So effective measures need to place the individual at the center of learning and to provide diversified opportunities at different stages of the life course. And as the working world becomes increasingly complex and uncertain, the provision of this guidance and training is becoming ever more important to individuals, employers and society and is a likely route to enable crisis resilience. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ingrid. So I think the, the, the keynote remarks by Ingrid really shows the wide, wide ranging nature of challenges facing young people and how the COVID-19 crisis has really placed additional pressures on top of existing challenges that young people faced um, when looking to transition into employment, but importantly, not just in the first transition from learning to working, should we say, but in future transitions as well. Um, there's a lot to get into, so I'm going to move over to the discussants, but before I do that, um, just a message to the audience joining us today. So thank you very much to all of you for joining. Um, you are all welcome to submit questions through the uh, questions and answers function, which you should be able to see on the Zoom. Um, we have uh, secretariat members who are monitoring that, and after we have the, um, we, after we have the discussants and then a few um, interventions by panelists, you will, we will also be going to audience uh, questions. So with that, I'd like to move over to the two discussants. I think Ingrid really started to go into um, going from diagnosing the issue into talking about how we can actually address those issues, um, in this case through career guidance, um, but I'm hoping we can also broaden the discussion. So I'd like to move over to uh, hand over first to Olli Holmström, uh, he is the CEO of the Helsinki Deaconess Foundation, which is a social enterprise working to provide effective social welfare and health services. He's also the chair of Eurodiaconia. So Oli, could you share with us your insights into how we can support young people drawing on your experience working in Finland? Thank you, Shunta. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Um, very pleased to be here uh, in this, meet, uh, this meeting and webinar. And thank you, Professor Sean. This was very, very thorough review in, in a small, in a, in a uh, complex, uh, how do you say, squeezed packet. Thank you. Um, the theme is not easy, and I will look it, into it a bit for those who live really on the margins. Uh, the young people are not a cohesive group. Our perspective in Eurodiaconia, and in my case, in Deaconess Foundation in Finland, is on those young people who live in the most vulnerable position. They belong to a generation that has lived through crises throughout the, the uh, growth of, of the generation. First, the economic recession, pandemic, uh, war in Europe. Uh, so the generational experience of this generation rises from from these social and global issues. And often young people who have experienced discrimination have also had growth threatening issues in their own lives. And now after a pandemic, there is a danger that young age groups will become even more polarized. And this is, this is hazardous. When we talk about attitudes, aspirations and crisis resilience, we talk about interactive relationships. Uh, and uh, also we have to ask what the, what the attitudes, aspirations of the local community or the surrounding society sets for these young people and what attitudes and aspirations the young people themselves have. At least our Finnish society is very performance oriented. Uh, and if a young person does not have a strong local area network, he or she may be left totally alone. So the loneliness experienced by young people has clearly increased since the pandemic. There are also signs of the return of a kind of a class society. So the solution for the future is how to get a different kind of message to young people. Uh, a, a message that they all are loved and important as, as themselves from the perspective of, of society and, and, uh, and in other words, the attitude of society must change. Young people want to make an impact, but do we hear them really? This is also true for those young people who live in the margins. They want to make an impact, but the channels for how to do it are few. Um, in, in a, for example, adding experts by experience is, is one, one good way to make, make, make the new future. And, 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 show show a better better horizon for 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 the young people because there are millions of young people in in this age group 15 to 26 29 in europe and, and obviously can we afford not to reach to the increasing mental indisposition <laughs> of young people who are after all the hopes of our future thank you Thank you very much, Oli. Uh, I'd now like to move on to our second discussant, uh, which is uh, Tanya Basarab. Tanya is the Research and Youth Policy Officer for the partnership between the European Commission and the Council of Europe on the field of youth. So Tanya, what are your thoughts and what can and perhaps should be done at the European level to ensure we are meeting the, the, the changing realities uh, facing young people? Thank you, Shunta. Thank you. Uh... Professor Sean and uh, Oli. Um, from our side, we've been monitoring the impact of COVID-19 on young people in the youth sector. And we have also done our own a bit scanning of the horizon as we cover all the member states of the Council of Europe, so wider Europe. And of course, we saw uh, very high aspirations of young people. And it is fair to say that they always have high aspirations. It's, it's linked to the age group, but also to uh, the expectations of building a good life. But the reality, uh, when it comes to how they were involved in the whole conversation around how to implement effective measures around protecting the population, young people were simply absent from that conversation. And so if we tie aspirations to attitude, clearly there were a lot of angry groups of young people who are not simply, they were not allowed to be part of that conversation. So of course, solution number one is to revitalize a, a participatory and an inclusive 
political dialogue. So we've been also looking at how young people connect to politics. It's not something new. It's not something that has been uh, affected only by the last two years, but there's been an ongoing debate whether young people really want to get involved in politics or not. And the research shows that they do get involved. It's just that because the space in uh, conventional politics is not enough for young people, they find their own way. So you have movements such as the climate justice movement uh, and other ones for, for example, housing rights and so on that are very powerful and they actually make an impact on policies. Um, maybe one other point uh, to make from our research is that um, overall, Perhaps the, this couple of years of COVID pandemic have highlighted what already was happening, this uh, precarization of the young generation and the growing inequalities, which reflect into accumulation of advantages for privileged groups and accumulation, and that's very important, accumulation of disadvantages for groups that were already experiencing uh, discrimination or uh, were more um, on the margins, as Oli mentioned. So there is a real need to actually reflect, and that's what we are trying to do uh, this year, especially to draw lessons, but also to reflect, are we using the right basis for policies uh, when we think that uh, looking, taking the concept of transitions and linear transitions as the right basis for providing services, developing them, offering them, and including young people in uh, supporting them to become autonomous, but also active contributors to society. Um, so I will maybe stop here. And if there are other questions, I'm happy to contribute. Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, we'll now like, now like to go to the panelists. Um, we have three panelists with us today. I'm not sure if one of them is on the call, um, but I see Nevenia Trofimenko, uh, who's the head of youth program at the Belgrade Center for Human Rights, and also Dominic Kirchdorfer, who's the managing director of the European Future Forum. So would either of you like to jump in now and maybe share some of your thoughts on some of the discussion you've had, we've had so far? Uh, thank you so much. Is it, if it's okay, I, I could start. Um, as you had opportunity to hear, I'm coming from Belgrade Center for Human Rights. And uh, for more than the 10 years, I am uh, directly working with young people and uh, on the field. And I have insights how the young people in Serbia are living, how they participate in decision-making processes, uh, processes and so on. Uh, what I would like to, to, to share here uh, are some insights how in Serbia uh, the uh, young people uh, were affected by COVID-19. Actually, uh, I have few messages, key, uh, key messages that I would like to share. It was very common in Serbia that uh, uh, it was very strong stigmatization of young people uh, in the first year of COVID-19. Uh, the epidemiologists who were the members of the crisis uh, government body, uh, they used the, all the possibilities to uh, to say that young people were guilty for the sp spreading of the coronavirus here. Uh, but we actually uh, are following youth rights in, in Serbia and we were following how the media are reporting about, about uh, young people here in the first year of, uh, of COVID pandemic. And we actually see that most of uh, it's like 80% of uh, media uh, use those negative aspects when they want to communicate youth in the COVID-19. And it was how the first uh, year of pandemic here looked like. In the second year of pandemic, we had uh, a little bit different 
a situation. Actually, it was the year of uh, vaccine and we uh, saw that young people here were not very, it was low interest for vaccination and uh, the government uh, create the communication plan and uh, they actually didn't, uh, didn't ask or didn't involve young people in the creation of that communication plan. It, it, the communication plan was actually one sentence saying that if we want to raise uh, the number of young vaccinated young people, then we will use influencers and YouTube, uh, actually two sentences. So we decide to, to create the campaign as um, NGO with limited capacities uh, and invite uh, UNFPA Serbia and uh, uh, student polyclinic with doctors to help us. Uh, we create a campaign with perfectly fit young people because the young people were asked and they created that campaign. In the end of the year, no, it was not actually the end of the year, but on the September of the last year, we saw how the uh, key epidemiologist in Serbia actually changed the narrative. They didn't put the young people in that position that they are guilty for everything. And we actually saw that um, uh, the switch in the in their narrative. We, think, we, we believe that it was yeah, because we are using also media and the social media media to say that 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 is not the right way if we you would like to to communicate uh, to to young people so uh, the bottom line is here in serbia we had a very uh, this, uh a lot of stigmatization uh and youth were guilty for the spreading of coronavirus. I actually do, do not know how it was in the other countries, but you have uh, the Serbia as an example for the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Novena. Uh, as a young person myself, I'm 26. So I think some of our definitions I fit within young. Uh, I can certainly uh, say that I know that some of my friends have a similar perspective that um, there's a sense that young people's circumstances and challenges have not really been taken into account and almost dismissed with young people blamed for some aspects of the, the COVID-19 crisis. So now I'd like to turn to Dominic, over to you. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, well, I'm 30, so I, I, I'm, I'm no longer really part of the youth by any stretch of the imagination, although I, I, I heard something about still being included in some of the broadest definitions, so that's very nice. But I, I, I was young once, not too long ago, um, during the financial crisis, uh, and perhaps I can tell you a little story a, about my, my experience during that time to uh, also pick up a few points that were made uh, along the way. So my personal experience has been that crises can be quite empowering if you are resilient enough, because uh, challenges usually mean that you need to be empowered or empower yourself to rise up to them uh, and overcome them. And this can, in, in my case, for example, can really uh, help with your career. However, you need to have the necessary resilience for this. And this is where we uh, run into problems because we need two kinds of uh, resilience in order to really uh, navigate uh, challenges and crises. One is individual resilience and the other is systemic resilience. Now, for me, individual resilience comes down to education and soft skills, because if I'm hit by a crisis, uh, for example, the financial crisis, or also when I was living in London, suddenly we had a Brexit referendum and I was no longer particularly welcome. Uh, I was able to leverage my previous education and my soft skills to further my career during these troubled times, because when uh, times are troubled, when we have crises, then usually new jobs pop up as well, where people are actually desperate for help to navigate these crises. And you can always learn new uh, hard skills on the job if necessary, because this is a, a one truth that's very few people 
uh, especially young people know about is that most jobs, you can't learn them in school. You can't learn them at university. You learn them on the job. The most important thing you can know are soft skills. So that's individual resilience. And then the second one is the systemic resilience, which is supposed to provide a level playing field, access to opportunities. And this is where we also have uh, a lot of work uh, going forward. So let's take a, the example of, of the financial crisis uh, when I myself was still a student and uh, looking for work. Now, because I was a student uh, in, in Austria and I had already graduated from high school, I was already having trouble finding just a student job. Now, this was a very different time, right? Right now, this might not be an, uh, an issue anymore. But during the financial crisis, we even low uh, income jobs or part time jobs were difficult to come by. So I wasn't even able to find a biker job or a cashier's job or even a waiter position because I was already uh, uh, considered overqualified with a uh, high school diploma. And later on, as I graduated from university, this became even more of a problem because then I was wholly overqualified for any kind of manual labor and for any kind of office position, I didn't have enough experience because you need to have experience in order to get, gain experience. Now, I was very fortunate because I come from a middle income family. So uh, my family was able to support me financially through my, throughout my studies. I didn't have to pay rent in order to study, which means that in Austria, where we don't have tuition fees, I was able to complete my studies, hooray. And then later on, when I couldn't find a job, I was able to create my own career by volunteering, by starting a nonprofit, by doing lots of different things that didn't bring any income uh, home. And as such, I wouldn't be able to do if I wasn't being supported by my family. And that's how I eventually ended up with my first proper job after the labor market uh, has had shifted again. A, a working class person might not be so lucky. Now, what kind of problems might a working class person have faced during that time? Well, first of all, uh, they might have gotten a job as a cashier if there was one available because they weren't overqualified if they didn't, for example, finish high school. If, if they got that job, they might stay in that job and they might not uh, move on further, especially if their parents uh, have similar kind of professions and they uh, encourage them to stay in that profession or to uh, go into that kind of field of work. So they might even be not just not encouraging, but discouraging them from going to university. Even if they uh, decide themselves, they have higher aspirations and they want to go to, into higher education and they want a different kind of uh, job or profession for themselves, they might need their family support in order to uh, finance themselves. Well, if their family does not want to support them, there have been cases, I've talked to many uh, such uh, cases where the uh, person then has to uh, do it by themselves, has to finance themselves because they're being even kicked out of their homes because there's a big uh, big uh, division between the, the family and what their aspirations for their child are and what the child aspires for itself. And that's something that governments wholly underestimate when designing uh, policy. So uh, in the end, we end up with a working class student who needs to work either part-time or maybe even full-time jobs, menial jobs, in order to support themselves to, uh, to study at university. Now, we scrapped tuition fees. This is why I mentioned this, because you were talking, Ingrid, you were talking about uh, rising fees. And I'm not saying rising fees aren't a problem, because they are. <laughs> but even if you scrap fees altogether, you're still left with this kind of uh, issue where, in our case, you're allowed to study for free, but only if you study full time. So if you study within the allotted time you have left, if you run over your time, if you basically are working full time or part time and therefore are not able to scrounge together all the ECTS you're supposed to in a semester, eventually you end up paying for your education which means the working class student then has a job and has to uh, shoulder tuition fees, which fair enough, they aren't that, that large, but if you are having a menial job with relatively low income, you might have uh, troubles with that already, especially given if you're studying in a capital city like Vienna and rent might be especially high. So you end up having working class students who subsidize middle income and uh, rich students who don't have to pay a dime to get their education. 
and they end up studying very long, which is also bad for their CV. And eventually they might end up on a labor market if they actually do graduate because a lot of them don't. They start studying. I was a mentor at uh, the University of Vienna and I had uh, many mentees who were working class students and the majority of them dropped out for one reason or another. And usually these reasons were financial and or uh, family concerns. Now, if they eventually do graduate, they might find their, their degree isn't that special and they lack the necessary knowledge and career preparedness in order to actually get a job and compete with, let's say, richer and middle in uh, income family uh, uh, graduates who might already know this uh, uh, information, who have gotten this from their families, from their upbringing, their environment, and therefore don't lack these uh, certain soft skills. So that's basically the, 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 the short gist of the story. And my lesson from this that I would like to present to you is that we need to really look when we dis uh, we're discussing and designing policy uh, to actually look at the root causes and that the individual resilience starts with the families and the upbringing where we come from and not uh, necessarily end with how much we have to pay for our education. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, I have lots of questions in my head. I think we had a very rich discussion so far. Um, but one recurring theme, and I think Dominic's point really illustrates this, is that there's huge gaps, right, between uh, people of different socioeconomic backgrounds um, and class. And you're getting this situation, as many of you spoke today, about how during COVID, these gaps have widened amongst young people. So if young people were doing fine before the crisis or, you know, were able to find a job and had good uh, financial situation, they probably still are now on the whole. But it's those young people who face difficult economic circumstances, who might not have been able to complete their education. It's this group that is really, uh, we need to think about how we can support this group um, be, you know, at this stage, but also going, going forwards. So I have a question to, I guess, all of you, and, and I think especially Oli, because I know you work in the, in the field in this area. Um, when we talk about young people in vulnerable circumstances or difficult situations or um, facing financial barriers, um, what kind of support can we provide these groups? Um, and can we add a bit more, you know, I, in many discussions I, I, I've participated in or moderated, um, I hear a lot about the need to make sure we close these, uh, you know, inequalities or support young people in difficult circumstances. But what, what is it that we can actually do um, at the working level? So maybe Oli, we can uh, right. have you, and then I'm sure others will also want to chip in. Well, um, thank you. I would um, I would like to to uh, over exaggerate a bit and say it's everyday help. It's uh, what, what people, what young people need is, is safe side by side people in their own everyday life. Uh, uh, you know, just to say you're okay, you're good, and not everybody needs to be successful, and the day is still coming, you know, even when times are tough. Uh, so, so the young people need encouraging speech and, and, and sense of inclusion, because that's something what, uh, what builds the trust. Uh, the trust is, is trust to, to, to oneself, trust to the society, trust for, for the future. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we need to build. And so in, um, we see that coaching, you know, for in, in uh, uh, intensive coaching, uh, uh, Dominic told, uh, talked about uh, mentoring. I think uh, uh, that's also very important to have peer mentors. But but oftentimes we see that professional coaching for 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 people uh, that that may take place in schools, may take place in 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 uh, in NGOs or other other actions. Uh, but it's so important that it's um, it's, uh, it's it comes in the relevant time. Uh, for those people. We see that uh, we can uh, drag people back to schools or to work life 
through intensive coaching, uh, which uh, which then can include also like uh, employee um, employment uh, uh, actions and, and, and so on. Thank you very much, Ollie. Does anyone else want to jump in? I see mm -hmm. Nivenya. Also, mm -hmm. just note that if you do like to speak, because I have six, I think five speakers here. Um, if you raise your hand, I can also see easily that you'd like to speak. So, but uh, Nivenya, I, I saw you unmic yourself. So please go ahead. I would just want to, to say just one sentence. I, I know that it sounds like mantra, but if we would like to change something, uh, we actually need to ask uh, young people. They should be involved in the creation of the uh, politics, no matter if the politics is connected with national level, level or a local level. Uh, when we want to improve the position of young people from vulnerable groups, then it's important to connect with them, to make good outreach, to connect with local community, to be with them and to feel, uh, to, to feel like how they are living, actually. Uh, it, it also it's very important to uh, to uh, to ask a youth organization uh, but real youth organization who are working with young people on the field here in serbia we sometimes have the, have the examples of gongo on organization which are close to government but actually it's fake participation so we really need uh, the real representatives of young people in the working groups uh, so they could share with us what are their needs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nivenya. Uh, I think we all fully agree with that point. Um, there's no policy for young people without involving young people themselves. They know best their issues and the challenges that they face and ensuring they're involved in every element of policy, local level, regional level, national level, the design of high level policy, but actually also the implementation of services at all these levels. I think it's really important that we do have um, young people's involvement. Uh, I see Tanya, and then I'll go to Ingrid after. So Tanya, over to you. Thank you. So from our research as well, of course, um, this whole question of what was needed for resilience was interesting to, to understand. And um, we didn't necessarily throughout the research reach out all the way to young people, but we reached young, active young people from youth organizations. And they were quite mixed messages. Uh, one was that young people wanted to feel useful and to contribute. And so they engaged in multiple actions of solidarity. Uh, perhaps a bit like the examples that Dominic mentioned, but by applying concepts of class and uh, different social or working class or something like that, we start to divide those groups that are perhaps a little bit, the nuances are a bit more, um, more less clear, and we need to see what, uh, what kind of services and examples of services and policies do function where young people are engaged. And so instead of repeating the message that we need to engage young people, we need to see what has been there as an example where young people were engaged and it really made a difference. And such examples do exist. Um, and uh, in our surveys, young people said that digitization has limits and that's something that we all need to be aware of and to try to understand and to critically engage with discussions around digitalization will solve the education problem, the employment problem and so on. Actually, no, it has its strength, but it also has a lot of limits. Uh, related maybe a bit to Professor Soon's uh, input in the beginning, um, a lot of the kind of motivating um, career possibilities for young people, they're not in career guidance programs. They're actually a one experience that is amazing for young people and then they want to 
become that person that was a champion for them. For example, that is often the case in youth work context and youth NGO contexts. Yet these are sectors that are very needed because they are the ones who provide this kind of round the person uh, full support. And at the same time, these are some of the most precarious sectors. And finally, I would say that it's very important to, to really engage in, in, an, in a reflection on our social protection systems for young people. They do not deliver. It is not true to expect that the family has to be the basis for a young person's start in life because that family also already comes with this baggage. And some are privileged and others are vulnerable to many uh, challenges. So in that vulnerability, of course, they do their best, but it is uh, ultimately we are experiencing and seeing a, a, an individualization and further pressure on the people who are least able to cope with uh, financial challenges, with uh, making it through in educational system in employment and so on. So we need to rethink and youth organizations have been asking for it you need to include young people in social protection, especially young people who are not connected in any system, either education or employment or uh, some form of training. And there is also on the other side, a whole debate about, okay, are we doing an overinflation of degrees of higher education degrees? Everybody goes to universities and then everybody is in the same uh, position of trying to find a job that pays enough, that gives them a good quality of life. So overall, deeper reflections on some of these systems that have been there and are not delivering for the young generation has to be happening. I'm hearing very much loud and clear from both Tanya and I guess Dominic earlier about the need to make sure that um, young people's future and young people's careers um, and the flourishing, it shouldn't be dependent on family circumstances because that strongly disadvantages people from less privileged backgrounds. Um, and Tanya made the point specifically about the need to reform the social protection system um, in order to make sure it delivers for young people of all backgrounds. So Ingrid, over to you for your thoughts. Right, so I think I fully agree with all the comments that have been made by the panelists. And uh, I just want to highlight that, yes, there is a lot of youth discrimination and uh, a number of social surveys they show that young people feel discriminated on because of their age. So I think it is really uh, the case, as Oli has said, that we society has to change their uh, uh, perceptions uh, of uh, young people, not considering them as a problem, but as a resource for the future. And uh, I think, um, very often young people are infantilized because they are now generally assumed these prolonged periods of education and the needs and the contributions young people can make are often not recognized. And um, I think uh, particular in the COVID pandemic, at least in the UK context or in my neighborhood, uh, we have seen that young people have risen fully to the challenge. They volunteered, they distributed food, they helped the elderly. They, so they really participated in society and in their community. And that brings me to the point that change often happens at the local or the community level. And um, that, um, I mean, parents are not always supportive and some young people cannot rely on their parents for financial, emotional support uh, to do uh, whatever they want in life. But I think there are, might be others in the local communities, significant others that can provide this support, as we have seen with the volunteering that then these relationships establish. But I think... Um, on a more general level, there is then also the need to, to have a place 
where young people can go to, where they have somebody to talk to, and where there is something to do. And that I think also feeds back to this career advice, because it can be offered, for example, not only in schools or uh, with these internships or uh, on based on the initiatives of local employer or business, but it can also be based on, on having one place where you know you can get the information you need. If, if you plan something where you meet new people, where you can have new inspirations and um, where you can learn new things that you do not know from your own family or from all the resources you're usually drawing on. So I think there have been these terrible cuts to uh, youth centers for young people. And I think that also should be reconsidered to provide young people also a place to go to, to talk to someone and to do something. Thank you, Ingrid. And I can only agree with your point that action at the local level is really important. As, and as Ollie, I think, said, is that, um, you know, one major concern um, that society is facing at the moment is the young people, uh, especially in, in wake of the pandemic, are, have been isolated in many cases or have not developed the connections with the local community or their social connections have been disrupted by changes to education, um, not being able to find work, all these areas. So, I think, I mean, I can only fully agree that we need action at the local level and we need to give young people a place where um, they can interact, they can develop their connections as well as, and in addition to, um, you know, find their next career or to be supported into their um, future career plans. So we have, I'm, I'm worried that we have uh, six people on the call today um, and we only have about seven or eight minutes left. Um, I have lots of questions I'd like to ask you about and actually one issue that I haven't been able to touch on but if anyone wants to expand on this it would be great is um, talking about mental health and how do we make sure that young people's mental health is supported through the crisis because I think this really ties also closely to um, individual level resilience as Dominic said I mean if you are in a place where you're not mentally healthy um, you're not going to be in a place where you're able to respond to crises changing circumstances disruptions uh, well. So that's just my uh, one additional point. I think if I had more, if we had more time, I'd love to discuss, but I'd now like to just turn back to each of the speakers um, with a key message or few messages that you'd like the, the audience to take back from this uh, session. So maybe I can go this time in reverse order. I'll start with um, Dominic, Novena, uh, and then Tanya, Oli, and finish with Ingrid. If you could just keep your remarks very short, just as we're short of time. So over to you, Dominic, um, for your closing thoughts for, for today. Right. Thank you, Shunta. Um, yes. So my, my message basically from, from my short story was uh, simply to look at the kinds of policies that uh, we are developing. If you're a local politician, for example, to not just involve uh, youth as well when you're designing policy for youth, but to really look at the root causes of issues, not design one size fits all solutions. And uh, Shunta, if I may just very briefly touch on, on the subject you just <laughs> kind of threw towards me with, with the mention of individual resilience uh, of mental health. Mental health is currently being fully stigmatized and it's one of the key issues, not just for youth, but also for, for, for people of, of all generations. And we absolutely need to learn to accept that mental health is important and mental health issues are not something to be hidden or uh, ignored because they're, they're there. Pretty much everyone has some form of, of mental health issue at one point or another throughout their life. And it's important that you get support and from people in your environment, but also that the institutions around you also support you when you're going uh, through any kind of phase where you might have any mental health issues. Thank you, Dominic. Over to you, Navena. Um, thank you so much. I was thinking what to say, like what, uh, and I have two uh, key messages, points, where we actually need um, a lot of um, uh, 
research. Uh, uh, we uh, when we talk about international support, international donors or donors, yeah. uh, we need uh, as a youth organization. It will be good if they could support youth organizations in the creation of uh, different researches. Uh, which could be, which will have a focus of the need of, uh, in the need of youth. And the second one is that we need to work together of the, on the creation of the good outreach methods so we could reach uh, young people from vulnerable groups and we, and, uh, and that will be the good link uh, to see their needs and to involve them in the in the process of the creation of legislati uh, legislation, and that's that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Navena. Over to you, Tanya. Uh, firstly, to your question on mental health, of course, it come came up quite a lot during uh, the pandemic. Maybe it became at the core of the of some of the debates uh, simply because of the uh, circumstances, and uh, what we know now is that uh, young people expect much more in terms of service support. Um, they and some of it, from our research, can be organized as referral by non-professionals. And some of it has to be dealt with professionals. So investment in both types of support, like uh, career guidance counselors or youth workers or a frontline contact person who is going to be acting as a bridge, as a confidence, as a trustworthy person to talk to. It's extremely important. It was highly uh, prioritized by young people as a need uh, during the pandemic. But we know that it's not a new uh, issue. It's just it became uh, really amplified. And as a message, uh, I would probably insist that it's important to involve young people in the design of uh, responses. There is now the Recovery EU programs being designed. Um, people are looking at what it means for young people. There's still no full youth proofing of most uh, legislation, and that is something that can be done as well. So there are many things that can be done to improve, but especially to really create these conversations that are with young people and they're not too toward young people. So I think there's a lot of work there to do. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, over to you, Oli. Thank you. I'm um, first of all following and seconding Dom Dominic. Uh, in this uh, individual resilience, in uh, I think in crisis tolerance. So one of the one of the young persons said once that if someone would have told me about emotional skills and emotional regulation as a child, I would have been spared many many problems. So this is this is obviously something that I we know that social services vary a lot from country to country in Europe. However, it seems that in marginalization is handled very often by project funding. And, and at the end of the day, that is not feasible nor, nor, nor sustainable. The societies, uh, the countries should really like take um, standard, more sustainable actions than, than kind of, uh, than trying to fix it with, uh, with, uh, uh, temporary project fund. Thank you, Oli. I'll give the final word to Ingrid. Thank you. I think the, the COVID pandemic has shown very clearly the importance of social relationships and also the physical contact. But I think these uh, jobs that uh, actually create social relationships and support su or to provide support in case uh, um, other structures are broken away. I think it highlights really the importance of this uh, social relationship and caring professions and maybe it uh, creates a shift uh, away from just the individualization and a higher valuation of these caring uh, occupations or caring relationships that uh, have more in mind than just advancing individual uh, fortune, but uh, thinking about advancing the fortune of others and society as a whole. 
Thank you very much. So I think there's many takeaways from, from today. Uh, I think for me, if there's any message that definitely rang true is that we need to also create a society which accepts young people, that society itself needs to create a better environment so that young people can really deliver on their potential. Um, we're out of time, so I'll leave it here. Um, before I finish, I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists, Ingrid, Oli, Tanya, Navena, and Dominic for joining us today and to the audience. Um, yes, so thank you very much for joining. The next session will start in about 15 minutes on young people, uh, younger people and the life course. So thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are.